All right. <laughs> Maybe we'll just switch to the mic after. We'll get that fixed soon enough. Okay. Um, yes. Uh, you know, I want to encourage you guys um, as well. Thank you, Julie, for the prayer. And in light of Christmas and the season, um, you know, it's the last month of the year already. It's already the end of 2021. Uh, I know there's going to be a lot of busyness as well for many people in this, in this month. Um, so you got to fight to uh, abide in Christ. You really do. Um, and, you know, for your uh, families as well. Um, yeah, just a lot of things going on. And so keep your hearts, be vigilant, keep your hearts guarded. Um, seek after him. Please do not neglect that in the midst of the busyness of the season. Um, and let's, hear th- let's end this year well as, as we prepare for a, a new year as well, okay? And see what God wants to do um, in us individually as well as in his church. Okay. All right, so what we're going to do actually today is we're going to spend one more week um, on Matthew or in Matthew. And then we'll take a quick break for a couple weeks in light of Christmas. So starting next week, uh, we're going to spend two weeks in the Gospel of John in the beginning section. Um, and we're going to talk about Christmas according to the Gospel of John. Basically, it's his prologue. Um, but I think there's a lot of wonderful truths there about Christ and, and the coming of Christ. So we're going to do that. But for today, we are going to um, continue in the Sermon on the Mount. And so we'll be in Matthew 5, verses uh, 33 through 42. Matthew 5, verses 33 through 42. Um, it's a, there's, there's about 10 verses, but uh, they're pretty short. So let's read that together. So if you would, would you please read along with me out loud? As we read this section, Matthew 5, starting from verse 33, okay, let's begin. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head. For you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Amen. Let's pray. Uh, Father, I know we're reading portions of this sermon by your son, um, Jesus. And again, I'm reminded of just how weighty it is to preach of Christ and of the cross, of course, and the work of redemption That is one of the most weighty things to do, and it's a great privilege, but um, how can a man do that well, God? Uh, But in a similar vein, as we preach, or as I get to preach from your own sermon, God, the sermon that you gave, Lord, I also feel inadequate, uh, because these are your words, and we can't improve on them. And so let me just, help me just to be faithful to them, God, and may your spirit uh, speak and and work and continue to convict your people um, in these areas of how we speak how we talk to others, God, in loving our neighbors, and uh, how we treat them as well, Lord. Um, And so uh, these are hard words. These are hard to do. But uh, we thank you for the example that you have set, Jesus, that you have modeled for us. And, of course, we thank you that you are the fulfillment of the law, God. You have fulfilled it perfectly. So we know that we don't need to do these things to earn something from you. We don't earn your favor, God. But we do want to strive in grace because of what you have done for us already. And we want to grow in grace as well, in obedience to you and to your word and your commands. So help us do that more. Cover me, Lord, once again. Apart from you, I can do nothing. Um, So we thank you, and in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, so I want to remind you guys quickly about this section. So, uh, you know, starting from verse 21 of Matthew 5, which we have already covered, Jesus is uh, giving these um, examples from one, the Old Testament law, including the Ten Commandments, um, along with other types of commands that uh, Jewish people would have known of, and rabbis and teachers of the law were teaching. Um, But he uses this teaching style in this section from verse 21 through 48, and we read verses 33 through 42, that some call the uh, uh, antithesis, 
or six antithesis, because there's six sections here. And basically, as you guys have seen, there's this style or rhetoric that Jesus uses to begin each section. He says, again, you have heard that it was said, and then dot, 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 but I say to you. Okay. And so that's why some scholars or commentators call this the antithesis, or the six antithesis. And so we're covering two here today, but basically what Jesus is doing is he's using this rhetoric or this style of contrast. And uh, he's showing, like we have mentioned, what religious leaders and rabbis were teaching about the law or how they were interpreting the law. And then he's contrasting that with the full truth and the meaning and the implications of what God intended for the law and for his commands. So he's correcting what these teachers and rabbis were saying about some of these things. Okay? And so today, what we see is we see this section concerning our speech. Specifically, he's talking about oaths and making promises, right? But, but more generally and broadly, he's speaking about how we use our tongue, how we speak to others, how we treat others by what we say. And then he's talking in the next section about our actions, right? And specifically, he's talking about um, this law of retaliation, which I'll explain a little later. But um, how do we treat and love our neighbors by our actions, by our conduct, okay? So... Words and actions, speech and conduct, how we are to talk to and treat others when it comes to loving our neighbors. That's how we could connect this, these two sections here today. And that's why I've, I've read them together and placed them together. Okay? Um, and as you know, too, and I've been saying that, what Jesus is teaching here as he's talking about God's commands is he wants to transcend the literal demands of the law. It goes beyond just keeping them outwardly. You know, like we, we talked about before, you know, the first two ones that he mentions is do not murder and do not commit adultery. And so a lot of people, even still to this day, you know, in our day and age, can still say, I've never murdered someone, literally. I've never committed adultery, right? I'm sure many of you or a lot of you can say that, I, 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 you know, I, I think. Um, but that doesn't mean that we're righteous, Right? Um, but the teachers of the law and the rabbis were reducing the law to just these external things. I've keep, kept these demands by not murdering someone, by not committing adultery, so I'm good. And Jesus is saying, no, that's not at the heart of God's commands. And, and it transcends just the literal and the external, but he focuses on the um, internal, our attitudes, our hearts and our minds, and how that too is to be in, law, in line with God's law. And it's not just our actions, but it's our whole being, right? And we also were reminded how Jesus fulfills the law. He alone could do this perfectly. So our burden is not we need to do these things perfectly or God won't accept us, but it's for those who are now followers of Christ, how are we seeking to live these things out? Or another way to put it, I appreciate this. Someone, I heard someone say this. As Christians or those who are now in Christ, we don't strive for grace, we don't work to try to attain God's grace in our lives. It's already been given to us. But we do strive in grace. The grace we've received, then we have to work out. We have to try to walk in obedience and humility. We have to fight the sin and the flesh that still remains in us. That's how we grow in grace. But we're never trying to strive for it as if to say, God, you know, please accept me now because of what I've done and how I follow your commands. But rather, I want to continue to follow your commands and obey them inwardly and externally as I grow in the grace that you have given to me. Okay? So these are hard things to do, but we know that we're doing them in the grace of God and by the power of his spirit. That's what he's asking us to do and to trust them in. So I do pray there's conviction as we go through these things, especially in how we use our words and how we treat others. Okay? But uh, we also know that it's through the grace of God working in our lives and our hearts and wanting to grow in that and the power of his spirit working in us as well. Okay? Um, so, uh, where Jesus continues to talk more about or emphasize more about how we love our neighbors, right? The, the two great commands are, are what? Or the greatest command is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength, okay? And then Jesus says the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Within Jesus' teaching here, of course, we are called to love God with all our heart, soul, and strength. But he also is emphasizing in some of these examples how we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. Okay? And we see that emphasis here when it comes to our speech, how we talk to others, and then how we treat them. Okay? 
All right, so let's look at the first section here, verses 33 through 37. Um, he begins by saying, You have heard that it was said of, to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. Okay. Now, again, you read that and you're like, oh, that's good. Yeah, a person should not swear falsely, and we should keep our promises to the Lord. If we've made a sworn something or made an oath, a promise to him, then yes, of course, keep it. And so Jesus is not saying that that's bad, but he is correcting something that was happening at that time with the religious leaders and what they were teaching. Um, maybe some of you have heard some of those phrases, kids use things like that or say things like that, you know, cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye, right? If they're lying or if they're saying something um, to, to give weight to what they're saying and that they're telling the truth, they'll say something like that. Um, some people will use that phrase, swear on their mother's grave or someone's grave, right? As to say, like, you have to believe me, this is truthful, um, I know for me, uh, when I was growing up with my family and with my cousins, I had cousins who were similar age, so we grew up together, we spent a lot of time together, we had this statement that we used to ensure that we were telling the truth, we were speaking the truth. And it was very simple, but it was this statement, promise to God. So if we were talking, um, if we were saying things to one another, if we were, I don't know, even competing with one another in some way, and then someone wanted to know whether or not we were being truthful about what we were talking about, we could just simply pull out the trump card, which was, you promised to God? And at that point, we had to tell the truth, right? It, it, and it really worked. It did. I don't, I don't think any of us ever lied when we did that. But if we said other things, or even if we said, I promise, it wasn't the same as saying promise to God. So we could say a bunch of stuff, we could tell lies, we could be trying to trick someone, et cetera, et cetera. And then when someone just finally said, hey, do you promise to God? I'll say, oh, I'm sorry, I was lying, you know, or whatever. Like, we would do that. But every single time, okay. Um, I know it sounds a little childish. I mean, I don't think it works still to me. If you ever think that I'm lying, why don't you just pull that out? And you can say, you promise to God? And then uh, we'll see. But, but um, I, I know that sounds a little childish. And, and the saying of the rabbinic teachers, uh, what they're saying, doesn't seem as childish. And maybe it even seems a little spiritual or seems spiritual. But what was happening was they were using this to provide some degrees of truth-telling and promise-keeping. So it was a way to not necessarily keep your word is what they were doing. Okay? And, that's why, and that's what Jesus wants to uh, uh, correct. Um, basically, they were teaching or saying to some degree, like, if you swear an oath to the Lord, you had to keep it. But if you make a lesser oath, and that could even be lesser incrementally by swearing on heaven. You know, heaven is not exactly the same as God. I promise to heaven. I don't promise to God. But even that, that's a, a little lesser oath. Or swearing by the earth, right? Or by Jerusalem. Or by your own head. What they were doing is they were creating these tiers or these degrees for some wiggle room as to whether you could keep or you had to keep your word or not. And if you did not give an oath or you did not swear to something or you just use ordinary speech like, I'll be there by 5 p.m. today, well, that was the lowest tier. <laughs> like, you did not have to keep your word in that case for sure, right? But this is what was happening. So in Israel, there was this trivializing of vows and oaths that was taking place. These teachers of the law were creating these loopholes, if you will, um, these levels so that they could be loose with their words and the truth without technically breaking the law, right? Um, one commentator, uh, Charles Quarles, he writes, some first century rabbis emphasized, not on, uh, emphasized, let me correct that, some first century rabbis emphasized only the importance of speaking truth to God and downplayed the importance of absolute honesty in all communications. They thought they had a special obligation to keep promises made to God specifically but could break promises made to others when it was convenient. So you see what was happening? Right? And there was a religiousness to that, right? Like, yes, God, I honor you, but when I speak to others, I'll choose the way of convenience, and if I'm lying to them or not telling the truth, well, that's okay, because at least I'm honoring, to you, at least I'm honoring you. Right? And so Jesus, in verses 34 through 36, he says, Do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. 
what he's saying there is, in, in a nutshell, yeah, don't swear by heaven, right? Um, you don't need to swear by heaven uh, because that's not anything less than God's throne. God is there. It's the same thing as swearing to God, right, or making an oath before God. And don't swear by earth because um, earth is not further from God, like some of the religious leaders were kind of claiming, like that's a lesser oath because it's the earth. But he says, no, the earth is God's footstool, right? He's sovereign and he has authority over all the earth. So don't swear by there too. That's the same as swearing before God. Don't swear by Jerusalem because that's the city of the great king. And then he says, don't swear by your own head. Um, And that probably had this imagery of a person saying, like, if I'm lying, I'll cut off my head, which sounds pretty severe and intense. But that was still kind of a a lesser tier type of promise or oath, right? But what does Jesus say? Don't swear by your own head because God is sovereign over your head, including the hairs on your head, whether white or black, right? Um, And so basically what Jesus is saying there is don't swear by anything. You don't need to swear by anything because God watches hears and knows all, and all our words are accountable before him. And that's why um, he says in verse 37, let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Um, Be a man or woman of your word. God is accountable. He hears. You are accountable to him. Uh, James chapter 5 verse 12. James also says this well in James 5 verse 12. Concerning our our words and our uh, yeses and noes. He says, but above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath. But let your yes be yes and your no be no so that you may not fall under condemnation. So the Bible is very clear of this. Now, let let me make one point, though, too, about vows and oaths in scriptures. Right. So some have actually argued that what Jesus is teaching, that he forbids all oaths or making any kind of promise or covenant. Right? Um, and I don't think that's taking into account the full teachings of, of God's word. But Jesus seems to be focusing more on personal relationships, right? uh, everyday types of relationships, how we speak, how we treat our neighbors, um, our employers, um, our coworkers, fellow students, parents, kids, etc., Um, And within the context of, like, let's say, the legal system, um, you know, vows or or making oaths was important. That was a part of that. Or, you know, the marriage covenant, right? There's an oath that needs to be made. There's promises that are made. There's vows that are taken. And that's good. God never says he forbids those things. If you tell tell your spouse to be, you know, in the back seat of a car or on a drive, like, I'm committed to you. I vow to stay true to you for the rest of my life. That's fine, but that doesn't mean the same as doing it before witnesses and before God. There's a reason why we have marriage ceremonies, right? It's not just in, the, you know, in some shadows that some guy promises something, some girl, and that becomes lifelong commitment. So there is the importance of vows. There is the importance of oaths. But Jesus is talking more about this in terms of our interpersonal relationships and um, how we need to be careful and mindful and true to our word. Right? And accountable for our words before God and truthful to others. Okay? So, uh, you know, what's, what are some possible applications? I mean, there's a lot. You know, James also talks about the power of our tongue, how that the little tongue can, you know, cause some big destruction, right? We could praise God with our lips and curse people in the same breath, too. So there is a self-control and discipline we need with our tongues. But in, in this area of you know, with our words and keeping our words, what, what can that look like? Let me just give you a few examples, and I know there could be more, and these were just some things I thought of, so it's not from the Bible directly in terms of, like, you know, God gives us these things, but um, a few examples, perhaps. You know, just a, a lying tongue, right? And I, um, I, I know there's different degrees to that, but is that something that may be true of, of you? And, you know, I think you, you know, or a person knows, if you do lie or you kind of get into that habit of that, it becomes easier to keep lying. And not only that, you kind of have to keep lying in order to keep the lie going too, right? It's actually pretty stressful and anxious. Um, And I remember at a previous church I was at, you know, over 20 years ago, but I remember someone there who we discovered over time, it, it seemed, even though he never admitted it, but that he had become a habitual liar. So there are just so many things about his life that seemed like they weren't true and that people never saw themselves 
but he continued to propagate that. And it, it was sad, and I'm sure there's some root issues there too or some things that would cause that, but we could see that kind of in a, in a person's life. And so that's kind of an extreme example, but we need to be careful with, with our tongues, right? So is that something that we may be more susceptible to? Uh, maybe a, a lesser version of that, but still nevertheless harmful, is just kind of having loose lips, you know, being loose with our words. Maybe we're more calculating with certain people um, in, the, in, the, in the work field, for example, right? Um, uh, coworkers, in business dealings, um, maybe with other people that we feel like we have to sort of impress. Um, and, and so one of the questions I would have for you guys too as followers of Christ, if you uh, profess to be and claim to be, is that do you speak differently in different circumstances? Yeah. Are your words different? Is there a dupliciousness to how you speak? Right. And again, I think really in certain fields, and you know, work is a big part, but that's where that gets tested a lot because you feel more of a weight to try to impress someone or to please someone. And so do you get loose with your words then? Do you make promises or you try to imply things to get a person to think like, oh yeah, you agree with them or you're gonna support them or you're gonna go with them even, but really you know, you're just kind of maybe playing both sides or, or whatever, you're doing what's beneficial to you or to your business or to your, to your job. Okay? And so that's an area where we do need to also examine ourselves. Uh, we don't want to be duplicitous with our speech okay? because, again, what comes out of our mouths is a reflection of what's in our hearts, right? the Bible makes very clearly. Or, or maybe some of us, we uh, tend to leave things out with our words. We purposely kind of leave things out. We don't tell the whole truth concerning what we did or what we said. And remember, too, the Bible is clear about that. Like, Satan is the father of lies, but he speaks and, and, and says a lot of truth, too. Like, it's not just based on full outlandish lies. No, it sounds kind of truthful. And then he twists that in a way. That's what false teachers do, too. It's not like they start spouting all these lies and people would think that's so foolish and they wouldn't buy into that. They're deceptive because there is truth in what they're saying, but it's partial. It's not the whole truth. Right? And so do we do that in some of our relationships as well? Are we a person that, you know, leaves out certain things? Or even when we share, we don't share everything. Or we share in a manner which makes ourselves look better and the other person look worse or, or whatever. Right? Are we accountable to our words in that way? And this last one example, it may not make sense initially, but I think it's at more of the heart of this, is that when uh, we are loose with our words or we're not accountable, we're not telling the whole truth, at the core of that is we're, we're seeking to love ourselves. And so when we lack integrity with our words, it's mostly because we are loving ourselves rather than loving God and loving others. So we'll protect ourselves with our words. We'll justify ourselves. We'll do whatever will benefit ourselves with our words, even if that means not keeping our words to others. Because ultimately, we're doing everything for ourselves with how we speak. That's the priority, right? Um, and so that goes against even Jesus' overall teaching in this section, which is about loving our neighbors as ourselves, right? And our, if we're loving ourselves more, our words will reflect that. Our speech will reflect that, okay? Because we're just going to look out for ourselves, and that will lead to um, compromise, etc. So how are you guys as parents? Uh, keeping your promises and keeping your, your word. That's why as parents, you should never try to promise your kids. And if you do, keep your word, okay? I like using we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> I don't like saying, yes, we will. Um, but don't be lazy and passive as parents in that way either. But, you know, how are we in our parenting? Or to your spouse, you know, um, as a son or daughter with your kids, uh, with your parents, sorry, brother or sister in Christ, as a friend, as a neighbor, are we godly men and women in our words? Of course, we have to be in his word too, right? We should be godly men and women of the word, and in our words, and in our speech, okay? Um, and so Jesus, you know, convicts and he challenges this loose ways of, of, of speaking that religious leaders were doing and were saying that was okay. And he's saying, no, this is not the intent of God's law concerning oath and commands, but also just in how we are to speak to others, right? And, and to have that heart and how we're to love our neighbors with how we speak to them. All right, so the next section, the, the second section in verses 38 through 42, um, he moves to the, our actions. Right? 
um, and words and actions are generally connected, then they should be. So how we treat others with our words and in our actions, they should go hand in hand. Um, now, he doesn't talk about all of our actions towards others, but in verse 38, he brings up the Old Testament law um, concerning this, uh, it's, it was called the law of retaliation. Okay? And it's there in verse 38 when he says, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Um, this is in the Old Testament law, but its main purpose, context, was in the legal system to ensure fair and just judgments. So I know sometimes when we read that, you know, we of course read Jesus' other teaching, which comes a little bit after this too, you know, like loving our enemies, etc., and even in this section, you know, turning the other cheek. So when we hear eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, we think that, wow, the, the Old Testament was you know, was uh, intense and, and, and uh, you know, it was, it was uh, more legalistic or whatever, right? You know, things like that. But what this law was there for was to ensure that when a person did do something wrong, did commit a cr- crime or committed an offense against some, uh, their neighbor, that their judgment would be just and fair in light of what they did. Okay? So if someone literally, and there's a figurativeness to this, but literally you know, cause someone to lose their eye, then the just judgment would be for that other person, the the perpetrator, the the one who had done the offense, to lose their eye. It wasn't eye and a hand, you know, and a leg, you know, or, or it wasn't more than that, right? That's what's saying there. So a tooth for a tooth, right? And so this was protecting there from being unfair judgments, unjust, unjust judgments being made against those, even when they're guilty, even when they committed crime or an offense, okay? Um, But what had happened was this law of retaliation, what these uh, rabbis and teachers of law were doing was they weren't just using it or talking about this now in the the courtroom or in the legal system, but rather they were bringing it into personal relationships. And so now this law of retaliation meant that in our personal relationships, there was a possibility to get vengeance or to retaliate against those who had wronged them. That's what Jesus is correcting. That's what Jesus is opposing here. This law used by individuals now to exact some kind of personal revenge or or vengeance. So in an extreme case, this, this would be something like vigilante justice, something like that, right? When someone says, hey, I've been wrong, my family's been wrong, then I'm going to take matters into my own hands, judge, jury, executioner, right? Sometimes that happens. But, uh, uh, of course, the more common one for people is uh, when this, this would cause people to treat others with a, you know, a tit-for-tat mentality, like it's about getting even, And so when someone does something to me, then I'm going to do this to them. The problem with that, though, is, and I think the Bible is aware of that, when we start doing that or when we think we're doing that, it's never about just getting even. We have to one-up that person, right? We have to do something a little bit more than what that person did. We may not start out that way, but that's our sinful nature. And that's usually what happens, right, as we do that. So what Jesus is teaching here is, you know, uh, don't do that. We don't want to treat people that way because that promotes anger and bitterness and malice. And so instead, what does he say? In verse 39, but I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. Man, it's hard teaching, right? It's hard to do. It's hard to accept. But he's saying, don't resist an evildoer. Don't be harsh, but kind. Don't hate, be loving. Don't look to get even, but let grace abound really difficult. But the, again, he's calling this in the, in the realm of our interpersonal relationships, right? With neighbors, with, with people around us, within everyday living. Um, and Paul, he, he gives a commentary on this teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. And I believe that he is teaching and speaking from this passage that Jesus preached on. But in Romans chapter 12, he says it well. In Romans 12, um, verse 17, starting there. He says, repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. 
For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And I appreciate, and we should appreciate Paul's commentary on Jesus' teaching, if you will. Like, he, he explains it a little bit more with more details and, and what that looks like. And he's not saying that God is an unjust God or an unfair God or he doesn't care when we are wronged by evildoers. But we leave that to him as well. We leave justice to him as well. But instead, in our actions, what does he say? Treat with kindness. Show love. Feed your enemy. Feed the evildoer. Feed the, feed the one that's opposing you. Right? That's the law in, in, in God's eyes. And that's what he calls us to do. Um, as we love others, including wrongdoers or evildoers um, around us, right? Or when that happens to us. Now, also understand this, that this is in the realm of personal uh, relationships. So this is not uh, a teaching that applies to the legal systems of governments and courtrooms and stuff. Like, it's not like, hey, just let criminals go free or if someone does something, breaks the law, well, don't, you know, it, that's not biblical teaching, right? Um, there's a place for justice, and, and we want fair justice and fair judgments, right? But um, just be, you know, when crimes are committed, it's not like we just say, okay, that's fine because you know, God forgives, right? So this is not talking in, in that sense, in terms of a legal sense or, or a, a courtroom sense or a justice sense. Um, one example of this, uh, many years ago, um, I loved... Uh, reading about, and, and I think even watching some too, 2018, so it wasn't that many years ago, but you guys remember there was a case, and I don't know all the details, I didn't study it, I just remember what happened in the aftermath, but there was a, a woman, um, police officer, she was off duty, she was coming home, and then she thought she was going into her apartment, her name was Amber uh, Geiger or something like that, and she walked into someone else's apartment, but she thought it was her own, and she saw someone there watching TV, a man watching TV, and then she thought it was someone that had broken into her place. And as a cop, you know, she had a gun, and she said, hands, show me your hands. And I, I don't know exactly what happened, but I think he reached for something or something like that, and then she shot him, and she killed him, right? And he was the right, you know, part, uh, uh, owner, or he lived in that place. That was his apartment. He had done nothing wrong, right? Um, and so she, was, she ended up uh, going to trial, and she was convicted, I believe, of 10 years in prison. But what had happened in the... Um, uh, sentencing, that's where something notable took place. The, the brother of the victim, uh, the, brother, the victim's name was Botham, Jean, I believe. Um, the brother, he asked for a moment to speak. His name was Brant. And uh, he stood up and he basically said, I, I forgive you, right? I forgive you. Um, and I believe my brother would, would forgive you as well. Um, and I also really want what's best for your life. Okay? And what I believe is best for your life um, is to give your life to Christ. He said this in his speech. Right? And then the part afterwards that I think caught a lot of attention was he asked the judge if he could hug her. Right? And the judge allowed it. And then here was this woman um, who had killed this man's brother, right? And they embraced, and, and she, you know, she was crying. Um, and, and we saw the grace and the forgiveness right, in that. But the other reality is that justice was served. Like, she still had to serve her sentence, right? But grace abounded in that act, forgiveness, okay? Um, and so in our actions, in our relationships, God calls us to show that kind of grace, right? And to not resist the evildoer. So he gives these examples um, in the rest of this, these verses, starting from verse, uh, middle of verse 39, Okay, but he says, if anyone slaps, on, slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. This goes back to what we've talked about some too. I think Pastor Brian brought it up a couple weeks ago. But the Bible talks a lot about right-handed stuff as being the right-handed dominant thing. So you guys know if you slap someone on the right cheek, um, you can't do that with your right hand, at least not with an open hand or even a fist. Like you would hit the person's left side, right? You'd hit the person's left cheek. So the only way you could hit the person's right cheek is if you did a backhand slap for a right-hand dominant person. And that was a way to insult someone gravely, or, 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 or it was a major insult, offense. Um, so that's the picture here of someone being slapped on their right cheek by someone slapping them with the back of their hand. Okay? Maybe it wasn't as painful as this way, because I think you could get more force, but it was insulting. It was offensive much more, right? And so I don't think this is also intended to be so literal, although maybe sometimes that happened, but it's when we are insulted, when we are wrong, 
be willing to turn the other cheek so someone could have another shot at you, <laughs> could insult you again. Okay? That's what Jesus is saying there. This great insult, let it become another insult if that's what's needed or if a person chooses to do that, the, the evildoer chooses to do that. Obviously, that's not our tendency. Our tendency is to want to get even. You know, someone insults us, we want to say, you know, I know you are, but what am I? Or, what, you know, something like that. Um, but the follower of Christ, we are to be willing then to be insulted again. Okay? Um, so that's one of the examples that Jesus gives there. And then he says, um, the, another example, verse 40, if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. What is he talking about there? Well, I think this is, uh, there's a, there's a uh, picture here of a potential lawsuit or something like that because a tunic, and he does mention, you know, being uh, sued um, for your tunic, um, a tunic could be used to make payment, okay? It could be used legally to make payment, to barter as well, um, and a person's tunic was that inner garment, right? It's like the shirt off their back, um, which covered directly their skin, um, and a person could be legally required to give that. So I think what Jesus is saying here is give more than what is required. So if someone has something and they have a legitimate grievance or something and you need to give your tunic, um, maybe it's not legitimate too, but you have to give your tunic. Well, don't just give your tunic then. Give your cloak as well. Right? And the cloak was a coat, and that was more valuable, far more valuable. And even in the Old Testament, um, there was a law that prohibited the poor um, to never have to give up their cloak or their coat because that could be used as a blanket at night, right, if they didn't have shelter, okay? So it was unlawful. You'd be breaking the law if you required someone to give up their cloak, even if maybe they had to as a means of payment or something like that. But it put, the law protected them. That's how valuable a cloak would be. But Jesus is saying here, no, if you have to give up your tunic, give up your cloak as well. Do more than what is required. Give up the coat. So that's a, another radical thing in terms of how we treat those, even those who resist and even those who are doing evil against us. And then he goes on, it goes further. In the next one, in verse um, 41, he says, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Okay. So the picture here is in Roman law, um, a Roman soldier, for example, could compel a person, and in particular a Jew, you know, whom they occupied and were over, to walk one mile, or more accurately, a thousand steps, carrying some kind of burden for them. So, you know, uh, Jesus' crucifixion, some scholars believe that when Simon Cyrene was to carry the, the, the beam of the cross for Jesus, right, remember? That this was that law in effect, like he had to do it, or the soldier compelled them to say, hey, look, you, you need to carry this, right? And so he would have been compelled to do that. But this law, if you will, or this compelling um, was only for one mile. That was supposed to be the limit, so a thousand steps. So if someone is forced or compelled by a Roman soldier to do that, after a mile or a thousand steps, they could say, okay, hey, I, I fulfilled it, so I'll, I don't have to carry the burden. Now, I'm sure that there are some Roman soldiers who probably still try to force them to go further, but what Jesus is saying here is so radical because he's saying, look, you may have been compelled to do that. That may have been required for you, by you, by somebody, but voluntarily, voluntarily, go another mile, right? That's the picture here. Someone compelled you to go one mile. After you reach that mile point, you don't, you know, go, that's it, I'm done. But maybe with a smile and as you whistle, okay, let's go some more, right? Let me carry this another mile, soldier. <laughs> you know? um, and, and what was the point there? That just, I think if you're doing that, that disarms that person, that softens their heart, right? Your enemy um, or the person who's compelling you to do that, right? This is that radical, but we also see what Jesus is trying to teach through that and how that can work in the person's heart in loving our neighbors, or in this case, even an evildoer, right? And then lastly, in verse 42, quickly, he says, um, give to those, give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. So be ready to help those who are in need. Now, this was interesting. I read something in a commentary how... Um, I'm sure this is true of a lot of cultures, but, but for Jewish people especially, um, it was, it was uh, really difficult to beg. In, in fact, many Jews would rather die than beg. Okay. So if a person actually said that they had a need then, 
that must have been a very desperate need, a legitimate need. So this is not talking about, you know, someone who seems like they, they're irresponsible or they're just trying to get a free handout or whatever and stuff. But this is, you know, when, when people are in dire situation and they're willing to ask for that, then be generous, right? Give. Um, do so wholeheartedly. Don't deny. Don't refuse. Don't make it harder for them. Help generously, expecting nothing in return. And, of course, remembering how Christ has given generously to us through the gospel of grace when we were poor and helpless, right? And so in those situations as well, we are to give and to give generously, right? To give with our whole hearts, wholeheartedly. Okay? Um, I don't think this means that we shouldn't be discerning when we help. And, of course, this is as we are able um, I like this one statement in the Didache, which was this early Christian writing, uh, this teaching. So it's not biblical, or it's not from the Bible directly, but this was this Christian writing um, in the early part of the church. And one of the sayings said, let your donation sweat in your hand. So before you give, like, you need to wrestle some with that. You need to have discernment, right? And that's okay. So let it sweat in your hand some before you give. Be discerning. So I think that's a good thing. But in general, we are to be willing to give and to help always, okay? Um, so in this section, Jesus talks about how we are to talk and treat others, and in doing so, we are to remember Christ and to follow Christ. Can I also say this thing quickly, too, about, you know, in terms of the context of for the Jew as they would hear these things, perhaps, right? Um, they were coming from a position not of power and authority. We know Roman occupation and much of their history, too. You know, there was, there was uh, exile, um, even though they're people of God, you know, God used a lot of nations to humble them and to discipline them as well. And in this context or at this time, too, it was, it was similar, right? Um, so for the Jew, as they're hearing these things, they might think, Jesus, what are you talking about? We, we get mistreated all the time. You know, a Roman soldier can make us go a mile and carry something, and then now you're saying go to, Right? You know, we have, to res- we, we have to love the evildoer, even though, you know, our rights and so forth. Like, that's the context. They weren't the majority. They weren't popular, right? And that's it. They didn't have power. But I'm reminded, that's the call of followers of Christ at times. Right? And, and if you have the notion, or if we have the notion that as Christians, that we are going to be the ones in power in a worldly sense, that really doesn't happen much. And even when it does, the church goes south. People of God compromise, right? They do evil themselves. They definitely grow more apathetic and they, they, they live for the world and themselves and they get, you know, tempted by. So when God actually grows his church, it's when the church is weak in terms of the world. That's when the church truly grows, when there's persecution and when there's hardships and when there are evildoers around, right? So remember that as Christians. And so this is kind of a piling on, it seems like, that Jesus is teaching here. It's like, Jesus... We're already suffering, you know? These things are happening, and now you're teaching and you're saying that we should do these things. If someone slaps you on the right, we turn the other cheek, and someone takes our tunic, and how much more can we give? But this is the call of loving others more than ourselves and the call of following Christ. And so one thing, too, just one practical thing in our current climate stuff, too. I mean, we could speak of what's going out in the world you know, and, you know, this last couple of year, or this last year or two, we've seen a lot of issues, you know, social issues. Um, people use the term social justice, of course, and I think that's loaded and we need to be careful because we want to always stick with what does the Bible teach about that, right? Um, you know, yeah, there's a bunch of things. I know you guys know there's vaccine stuff, there's, there's all these things, and, and um, one of the things that's happening, though, is how we treat others, how we speak to others, it, it, it lacks kindness, right? It lacks humility, and including in the church. Okay. So, yes, we should stand for our convictions and for truth, but one we need to know is that as Christians, we're never supposed to be popular. We're never supposed to necessarily be the ones that are in power, right? Oftentimes that corrupts his people, right? And so what Jesus is teaching here is the way of the Christ, is the way of the cross, and this is, should be applicable and should be seen in our relationships with one another, and our relationships with our neighbors out there as well. And it's hard. It is. I know it's hard. But this is what he's calling us to. Again, because of the example that Jesus himself has given us. right? And what he has set before us. Um, so we are to remember Christ and follow Christ. He always spoke the truth. He is the truth. 
No deceit was in him. He did not retaliate when insulted, attacked, and then ultimately crucified. He did more than turn the other cheek. He did much more than that or go an extra mile. He gave his life. He poured out his blood for our sins. He forgave our transgressions. And he continued to trust in the Father. And so must we. Right? Um, I want to end just by reading 1 Peter 2, 22 through 24, which speaks of Jesus, who, are, who we are to remember and follow in, in his example, and then also to remember you know, what he's done for us. But in 1 Peter 2, 22 through 24, Peter writes, He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. And then he says, He himself bore our sins in his body in the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. If you're a follower of Christ, we're called to a higher calling, a different kingdom than this world, right? And that will mean then, you know, with our speech and how we talk and even how we are willing to be treated, it looks different. It is different because we are securing Christ. We are his sons and daughters, right? And so we don't have to demand certain things that we may think that we're, you know, people think they're entitled to, but we're able to follow his example in this way and to live this out, um, as he asks us to, um, as he asks us to trust him in this and to, to grow in grace in this way. So how we speak with others, how we treat others, are we doing that in a manner that you know, reflects God's grace and mercy in our lives? And are we practicing that, right? Um, what does that look like for you? And uh, what does that look like for you and some of your relationships now? Let's pray. As we, as we pray, I do want to ask us to take a moment to um, examine our, our hearts, yes, but also perhaps our, our, our tongues um, and our actions, our responses towards others. Um, it can be difficult at times, especially when you know, we feel like there are people against us or doing things towards us that seem unwarranted, um, it's making life more difficult as well. Um, so I, I know there's relationships and situations that we can all think of as well where it's, it's hard to follow Jesus' commands. Um, but uh, can we ask him to continue to humble us, continue to soften our hearts, continue to have us look to him, not only the work that he did on the cross, but everything that led to that and his example um, and can we be more and more secure in him and what he has achieved for us and how he watches over us and how he will judge justly as well? These are all things that are in his hands. And so as we trust in his sovereignty, as we trust in his goodness, we do the things that he calls us to do and how we are to love our neighbors as ourselves, including evildoers, and how we are to speak in a manner that loves our neighbors and is accountable to God and truthful to others. So if there are any areas where he is convicting you, would you bring that to him in humility and repentance? Would you speak Jesus over your own heart and the hardness perhaps that may be in your heart towards someone or some situation? And would you ask God for more grace, more softness, and for him to work in those situations as well? Okay. Um, and so, yeah, let's turn to him. We turn to him as our example, and we turn to him as the one who can only change us and transform us by the power of his blood and by the grace that he has bestowed upon us in his work of redemption. Um, and so let's take a moment to do that, and then uh, we'll sing as we close.